Good evening, everybody. Well, thank you very much, uh, very much for uh, attending here tonight. And uh, so I just want you to pull out your cameras and point them at me. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we always like, you know, have uh, some good humor. And, uh, you know, just thank you, Ed, for the uh, introduction. And uh, so what I'm going to share with you uh, this evening is, um, I guess, a scaled-down version. There's a lot more, more to the, the his history of the Papa Shays First Nation, Papa Shays Band. And uh, by no means am I an expert. I'm still learning. So what I'm about to share is, is basically what I've learned over the years from elders, from researchers, historian friends. And uh, so I'm just going to do my best to share what, what I know and help to pass it along and help you gain a better, <clears throat> excuse me, gain a better understanding of, um, of the, uh, of what happened to uh, the, ba the band. So I have to be uh, uh, a multitasker here tonight. So, um, so anyway, we'll start off with uh, what ha the origins of the Papa Chase Band. And Papa Chase and his family, they were actually originated from around Lesser Slave Lake area. But you got to understand the history of, our, of, of the Aboriginal people, Indigenous people. They were nomadic. And so today, you know, you have lots and acreages and homes and all that kind of stuff and, you know, set boundaries. Back then, we had territories. And you had your summer um, camps and your winter camps. And so they had vast ranges and territories. So this will give you an idea as to, you know, and, but not only that, there was also the fur trade that was going on. And so that uh, really played a part in where uh, the, the nations back then would uh, often, uh, you know, reside or the territories that they, they eventually took over. So Papa Chase and his family, he had six brothers and a half sister. And they came to Edmonton along with their uh, widow, <clears throat> Excuse me, with, with, with her mother was at Gladju. And uh, first they came down to Fort Assiniboine, which is up by Barhead. And then from there they went to Lac Saint Anne. And that was a uh, Metis encampment for a while. And then eventually they came to Edmonton area in the uh, 1850s. But just to backtrack a little bit, the fur trade uh, came from the um, uh, Hudson Bay area. And so uh, and what happened was there was expansion out west and the Crees were the strongest tribes back then because of their cl uh, close uh, marriage ties and business ties with the fur, tra fur traders and eventually that's where the Métis came from. But they used to be allied with the Blackfoot but coming into uh, now it's Alberta territory uh, they started to battle each other in late 1700s, early 1800s to mid uh, 1800s. And so they had uh, these, these wars. So, so you had the Cree moving into the Beaver Hills territory. And that is actually from uh, Edmonton area here out west to Elk Island Park, just to give you an idea. And um, so, the, um, so here's a picture of the uh, fur trade. And so they, uh, you know, they, they worked with the, fur, the, the, the companies and in 1795 is when they first set up the first forts here down in Rossdale, Rossdale area. There was a total of about six forts at the time uh, over the period of, of years. And they, um, you know, they eventually got flooded out, moved to Fort Saskatchewan, moved back again, early 1800s. And they got flooded out in, uh, uh, um, a, a couple of times actually, about 1821 and about 1830. So here's a good, a good picture of uh, what it would have been like back then with uh, loading up the, the, the furs onto the, uh, onto the Voyager boats. And they eventually would probably take about two months to paddle down all the way down to the uh, uh, Hudson Bay. And then from there, then, then they would ship them out um, through the Hudson Bay out to Europe. And so it was big business. And Papa Chase and his family were part of the fur trade uh, helping uh, one of his brothers is named Bateau, 
And that's where he got his, his name from, was working in the, the, the freighting. Um, and, but they all were also hunted. They hunted a buffalo and other animals. And so they, they helped uh, with the fur trade that way. Now they, uh, <clears throat> now with the fur trade, uh, you know, coming out west, and with the wars of the Blackfoot. And so this is a picture of, of, of that we believe that it says Papa's Chase on there. And he was a, a warrior at one time back in his younger days. And so it says that helped, he helped to lead the, the wars with, against, uh, against the Blackfoot. So in the Beaver Hills area, so we're talking about Hay Lakes, New Sarepta, Mickalong Lakes, um, Battle River, Camrose, all on that territory, all the way up to Elk Island Park, going towards uh, Bruderheim, Fort, uh, Fort Saskatchewan. So those are the Beaver Hills. That was the area and the territory that they, 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 uh, they eventually took over because the Blackfoot used to, um, their territory was up until the North Saskatchewan River. And so they fought. And, uh, and that's how eventually uh, Papa Chase became a, a minor chief. Uh, there was another chief, but it, uh, his name was uh, 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 Chief uh, Lapatak. And uh, he passed away in 1861. And so eventually Papa Chase became a, a chief in his own right. So uh, a couple of things happened uh, late 1850s. Of course, Papa Chase arrived about 1856 in, in the area. And uh, the Palliser expedition, uh, he was commissioned by the government to come out west and he was a surveyor. So basically what they were doing is they were, they were surveying the land, what they can use it for. So they looked at all the resources, they looked at what was fertile, where they can grow crops and everything like that. So they, out, they came all the way out to BC. And so they, had, they created maps and everything. But he also came to Edmonton. But here this is a, a painting of when uh, Father Lacombe arrived in 1858. So you have these three factors that really played a role out west, you know, the, the arrival, well, with the Cree moving out west, uh, the, the arrival of the missionaries, and also the fur trade that was going on, but this Palliser expedition, because that's going to play a role, because they were scouting for the government, and they were also looking at for a route for the railroad to come out west. Okay, so, so here's a map. And uh, I got a text, but I'm not answering it. <laughs> they can wait. Uh, I'm busy. Uh, so here you can see this is a, a map of the Crees. So I just want to point out here that uh, this is where my ancestors, Bruno's, came from, area of Montanay, um, down in the, 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 the Six Nations uh, Mohawk Territory. And also, the, that's where the uh, original ancestors of the Michelle Band uh, came from as well. And then they came out west here. And uh, of course, this is Alberta. And uh, so I want to point out another thing too. Up until Manitoba here, when they created the Manitoba, all of this was the Northwest Territories. All this, now it's up here. But before the provinces were created, this was the territories as well. And so you can see the different Cree groups, the Woods Cree here, you got the Plains Cree. So this was the expansion from Hudson Bay. And um, so when they would go back to take the, f the furs, they would travel this way and go to Europe. So here down is where I'm talking about our area here, central Alberta. And too bad we didn't have the river here, but that was the boundary where the Cree and the Blackfoot, the Blackfoot, that was the boundary but they're pushed down to the Red Deer River, which would be down here. So that's where they're at today. So this here was you know, overtaken by the Crees in Treaty 6 territory today. Uh, so all in this area. And this would be tre Treaty 8 territory up here. And I um, just wanna show you that. So Fort Edmonton, of course, is a destination point. So we're gonna have some pictures here uh, this here is where the, the present day legislative grounds are today. And, uh, you know, you can see the steep bank, but now it's all cut down. You got a road there. 
and uh, of course the high level bridge. But this, I can't, I'm not sure when this was taken, but this is probably about 18, about 1870. And this is a famous painting by Paul Kane. And uh, then you can, of course, see this is about 1870, no, I think it's about 1857, I think. So this is around the time when Papa Chase was there. And uh, so you can see the, uh, the teepees here. So today this would be Rossdale out in here and the Epcor power plant up here is the, where, where the legislative grounds would be. And, um, and of course, this, this is the south side here. And um, yeah, so this is, this is you know, it, it's quite an accurate painting, but, uh, but still it, it depicts what the life back then. And here's more pictures. And I just wanna show this area over here this area here would we believe would be the burial ground that uh, uh, is down by the Epcor's power plant today. So you can see the fort, and this is what it looked like. Now it's all all buildings and everything today. That's what it looked like back then. So you're looking at uh, 1870s in that area. So this is a painting uh, depicting a uh, Métis hunter. And um, so you can see his encampment there, and uh, he's hunting for the fort, and so he's going out on a river, probably getting uh, beaver and uh, different animals, fish, that kind of thing. So this one is actually taken about 1890s, but you, so you can see, start to see the, uh, the development on up, up here with the houses. As you can see, they weren't there before. Uh, so this is the big house, as they called it. And uh, so this is Riverbank here, where, and today there'd be a River Valley Road coming across, and uh, leg legislative grounds, of course, up here. Okay, so we have uh, the early history, so um, I'm just gonna leave this here. So Papa Chase and, and uh, the, uh, his family, they lived in the uh, Beaver Hills area. And then, of course, lived in a Rossdale. And you can see the evidence of the teepees that were there. And uh, there'll be more pictures coming later. But um, see, they, what they did was they, they worked in a fur trade. And, but when the treaty came, uh, they, they signed treaty in 1877. But first, it was signed in Saskatchewan at Fort Carleton at, uh, in 1876, August 23rd. And that's uh, central Alberta. And then up by uh, Onion Lake, uh, there's Fort Pitt, and that was signed in September in 1876. So they realized that they missed some bands, and they came a year later. And August 8th, they were at Musquechees. They signed those bands there. Then they came to Fort Edmonton. And August 21st, 1877, they signed treaty with uh, Papa Chase and his headman, uh, Takuts, and um, that was his brother, and along with uh, Alexander and Alexis, so, uh, so those, those are First Nations today. So the bands that signed treaty at the time, those are the names that they're named today. And this here, and it's really ineligible, but uh, uh, you know, it, the, this is a very old document. And this is a treaty pay list. And up here, it's, it's hard to read, but it, it has uh, Papa's Chase, and then he, his wife and children. And so according to the treaty, uh, they were, uh, the chiefs was, was paid $25, the counselors were uh, $12, and that's where the, the $5 uh, treaty payment comes in. And, but also they were given a bunch of promises. Uh, for each member is 128 acres. And there was, there was also um, farming implements. Cause they were trying to get them from a uh, hunting gathering society and they want to turn them into, get, put them on reserves and turn them into farmers. So in the trees, there's farming implements that were promised. And um, there was also uh, a medicine chest clause. And so in case when they needed medicine that the Indian agent on the reserve would have, it's almost like, a, you know, not, can't, it would be more of a, more of a, like a first aid kit providing uh, necessary uh, uh, medicinal relief for them. And, um, there were also, uh, in, in times of famine or pestilence, 
uh, they had asked for uh, that they would be uh, taking care of. So that's going to play a role uh, coming up. So here's a, a copy of the pay list. And so these are uh, uh, members back then. And we'll get into that uh, after they signed treaty. So here's a picture of, of uh, back then, back in the 1800s, a um, bunch of men. There's a parade going on. And um, so th that's a group photo. And so here is uh, a picture, depiction of the uh, treaty making ceremony. And they signed it at Fort Pitt. So that's at where present day legislative grounds today. And that's where it was signed. So uh, they signed on behalf of their members here in Edmonton. And uh, that was uh, another uh, a reason for dispute that the early settlers, that uh, they, they didn't want the, uh, this happening and they didn't want the Papa Chase Reserve located close to their settlement. So here's another uh, picture. And those would be chiefs and uh, we're making the treaty. So the so they, they uh, so the treaty is between two nations, and under international law, it's um, you, you cannot ratify it, you cannot uh, modify it, and you cannot uh, enter out of uh, uh, the agreement. It's a contract. So uh, you know the um, the First Nations uphold the treaty highly, uh, getting Canada to um, honor those treaties. That's that's another matter. And so uh, we're going to go into that part uh, soon. So here's uh, the uh, survey map. And it was started in 1880 uh, by, uh, I can't remember the, the surveyor's name. There's actually two of them. But uh, so here's, uh, we'll, get it, we'll show you another map later. But here's the North Saskatchewan River. This would be downtown today. And you can see this here. This here is Harlack Park. So you see this angle right here, and we'll, we'll show you another map what that actually means. This is actually the original boundary of the reserve because of these uh, river lots that they had back then. And, but it was moved further south here because the settlers were complaining that it was so close to, uh, and also uh, Frank Oliver, and we'll get into him later. But this, so this, this uh, map was started in 1880, but it wasn't completed until 1884. So this is the south side uh, today, but we'll show you a map that uh, actually shows the location, the boundaries. And based on the pay list of what I showed you earlier, here's another, another map. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple uh, places. So here, this would be McKernan area. There's actually a lake there. And the two hills, Mount Pleasant Cemetery is one of them. And there was a lake there at one time. And that's where the band used to live around here and around here. So, uh, you know, Strathcona is over here, and when they would go in, into the Strathcona area, they would come back here, and this is where they had their camps as well. But they also follow, uh, followed the, uh, the uh, surveyors just to make sure that they were getting the, their amount of land. But how they came to that amount was, see, it actually should be further up. Uh, it was went on the pay list that I showed you earlier, they um, actually had about 249 members, and they're supposed to have, uh, I think it's about 48.9 square miles. And so this here is 39.9. What happened was uh, a new uh, pay list was created for what's called a group called the Edmonton Stragglers who were living around Fort Edmonton here. And they were moved from Papa Chase onto this uh, new list, and they weren't given a land or anything like that. But... Um, here they um, uh, were reduced to 188, and so that so based on that number, then they reduced the size of this land base to 39.9 or 40 square miles. So here is uh, another map, and based on the, the there was a, a a deal where Hudson Bay Company, uh, even though they didn't own. Real, really owned uh, Western Canada. They sold it to Canada still for 300,000 pounds. Then they got huge tracts of land, as you can see. So this is downtown area. And um, so here's the legislative grounds, Fort Edmonton there. Uh, there used to be a ferry that used to cross, but now we have the bridge today. 
Um, so this trail out here, this is a, a trail out to Sto uh, Stony Plain, which would be going out towards Enoch. This is a trail out to St. Albert Trail, out to St. Albert, and uh, Fort Saskatchewan Fort Road. So actually, this, these, you, these roads, these trails, are actually our road systems today. And um, so you got Calgary Trail here. And so here was the original boundary, like this. And we'll get into that in a little bit. I'll show you another uh, map. And so this here would be University Area today and Harlech Park. And this would be uh, Cloverdale in here. So here's another map that uh, this here, it says, talk, says Beaver Hills, so it shows a uh, you know, big area, but it, you know, it extends further over to be, uh, Elk Island Park. The Papas Chase Reserve here, the settlement of Edmonton here, and uh, Enoch's Reserve here. So you can see they're pretty close, actually. They're so just across the river from each other. And we'll get into that later, uh, how that played a role. And then here you have uh, the uh, settlement of St. Albert. Okay, so here's here's uh, just another picture, just affirming that uh, you know the the Crees were in the Beaver Hills area in the 1850s, and here's uh, you know, and that's one of the unfortunate things that, that they didn't have names for this, a lot of these people. They just took pictures, and sometimes they would put like a Cree Indian, and that was about it. So we're talking about uh, treaty. So here. Um, So this is a copy of part of the, the treaty document and that they signed the adhesion at Fort Edmonton. And I just wanted to show this here just to show a little bit of humor. Um, you, you know, you talk about the, the pioneering spirit of, of our early settlers. Well, you know, the, the horses were hard to come by, so, you know, you had to make do, right? So they, they enlisted a couple of moose and, you know, and. You know, I'm not sure if they put them out to pasture later or not. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, so, um, and it doesn't say who, who the gentleman was, but, uh, yeah, so they had the early, um, um, so here, this is the map I want to show you. So, so here's the Hudson Bay Company Reserve, the fort here. The burial ground I mentioned is down in here. And so this actually is, is uh, Laurent Garneau's uh, land where the Garneau neighborhood is today. So this would be university up in here. And so I want to point out these river lots here. They're actually uh, members like say uh, William Ward, uh, George Kipling, and uh, Isaac Daniel. And they were actually either members of the Publishers Band or were uh, married to uh, members. So they thought their, their lands would be safe uh, see this being the, 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 the boundaries of the public trace uh, reserve here that they were looking at. But what happened was um, yeah, they eventually lost their lands and uh, you know then the settlement of Edmonton took over and then eventually you had the town of Strathcona. And they, so you had these claims uh, that were uh, basically being disputed and so the, the reserve, they, they wanted to move it further south here. And so this is a map today, 1998 actually. And so you can see the boundaries here on the uh, basically southeast section of town. And so 51st Avenue North, 119th Street on the west, uh, 30th Avenue South, and uh, one, uh, 17th Street on the east. So you're looking at this big fair uh, chunk uh, of Southside. Now what I want to get into is uh, what happened back, back to the band. So the, there was a lot of disputes over to um, uh, there, was, there was a dispute that actually of, of um, what happened with the uh, band back then. The, a, lot of, a lot of settlers, they weren't happy with uh, the lo location of the reserve and they disputed it. And so they were upset and they were petitioned the government twice actually and uh, Frank Oliver, who was uh, a newspaper man at the time, and he had the Edmonton Bulletin. 
and they sent petitions to Ottawa and they, what they said that, that the land was needed for better men. They want to remove the publishers ban 20 miles away and uh, you know, basically that they were gonna be a hindrance to development. So they were upset about uh, you know, where the, they actually chose the reserve and, where they, the, and the location. They wanted the land. It was the best land in the area for agriculture, uh, agriculture and farming. And, but what happened was um, you know, they wanted to protect their way of life. And that's why they signed the treaty as well too because the buffalo was declining. So that's why we have pictures here of, of the buffalo. And so the last hunt was uh, in 1879. Uh, uh, the Métis from St. Albert, along with uh, Crees from Papa Chase and others, they went further south, and that's where the herds were. But uh, they, you know, they weren't that successful. So now they had to rely on the rations for, from the government. So in the 1880s, uh, there was mass starvation going on with the, with the First Nations out west here. And because of the Treaty 6 uh, uh, promises, they uh, petitioned the government, and what happened was the Indian agents were withholding uh, uh, rations and food from them and there was about 3,000 people out here that starved to death during that time and the the government wasn't upholding their promises you know to in, t in a time of famine or pestilence that they would um, you know, provide relief to them and so they um, so here's more pictures of uh, you know buffalo buffalo hunts So the Treaty 6 bands were uh, in trouble and they knew it and they were petitioning the government. And so there, and what happened was, um, just to backtrack, uh, in 1880, what happened was uh, Papa Chase Reserve was, was, was uh, surveyed, but they reduced the members and created this, this uh, stragglers list. What happened was out of that stragglers list, then um, it was uh, Enoch Lap attack was in there. And so they promised him a reserve west of the city and they uh, uh, created a publish, uh, the Enoch Band. And so the early 1880s and that their, their reserve was surveyed as well. And uh, so the band went over there. And so it was making way for a development. And what happened was um, in the 1884, some uh, uh, chiefs from Muscochis down south in Hobima came to Edmonton here and along with Papa Chase, and they came to, to the fort, and what they did was they uh, were wanting rations for their people. And there's a, um, uh, they, they were sending, a, they want to send a letter to uh, the prime minister as well. What happened was they, um, uh, they were upset that their women were having to prostitute themselves for, uh, to just to feed their family. And, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of starvation going on back then. And so they were, in, they were in dire straits, but also they were hearing about Louis Riel out in Saskatchewan and uh, the Métis claims. And what happened was uh, they sent off this letter and they basically sent, uh, told the prime minister that they would di rather die fighting and rather than by starvation. And in 1885, then that's what happened was with the Riel rebellion. And so the chief uh, um, Big Bear, let's see if we can get a picture of him here. Okay, this is Métis script. Um, we'll stop there for now. But, um, so Chief Big Bear and Poundmaker, they joined uh, um, Louis Rail in their fight against the Canadian government. But uh, they sent runners over here with tobacco to uh, Chief Papa Chase and other chiefs around the Edmonton area uh, wanting to enlist their help. But they refused. Uh, they basically didn't want to enter into the fight because uh, they would leave their uh, families and uh, their reserves open, uh, you know, to attack from the people that were around here, the settlers, and they didn't want that. Or in case they died fighting, you know, in in the big war with uh, the Canadian government, then they wouldn't back, and they would leave their families vulnerable. And uh, during that time, uh, Laurent Garneau, the uh, the he was. Uh, he was a supporter of Riel, and he let everybody know it. And he was actually jailed for six months. And Papa Chase took in his family, uh, his wife and 11 children, and took him in for six months and fed him and, and looked after him. And Garneau never forgot that. So there's a tie and connection between uh, Lauren Garneau and, and Papa Chase. 
So uh, uh, here's, a Mate, here's a copy of the Métis script, and that's going to play a role in what happened with the Papa Chase band because, like I said, there was starvation going on. And, you know, people, people were, were trying to feed themselves. You know, the animals were depleted in the, the general area. Um, you know, Indian agents were withholding food and rations, and the government couldn't withhold, uh, uphold their uh, treaty promises. So there was people in, in, uh, um, in desperation. And what happened was uh, the, there were speculators that followed the treaty commission, and they were offering this Métis script to anybody who, who basically self-identified as Métis. But, uh, you know, it was basically a, a way of getting ready cash. But these speculators would buy this off to Native people, usually at a bargain price. Here it's uh, $160, and back then that was a lot of money, or uh, um, 160 acres of land. So they're basically the, the, the Native people were, and Papa Shea's band and others were selling this land or selling, or selling their Métis script to these speculators who in, ter in turn would sell it to settlers. And that's how they were getting their land as well. But what happened with Papa Chase was in 1885, uh, 12 members uh, took the Métis script, were discharged, kicked off the band, and they couldn't uh, live off there because now they're considered Métis. And um, in 1886, the uh, majority of the band, including Papa Chase and a lot of his family, they... Um, they they, they uh, left the uh, reserve as well. They were forced to uh, leave. They they were mistaken. They thought they were led to believe that they can stay on the reserve and homestead those lands, but uh, they um, they they didn't actually. They couldn't. So because they were considered now Métis, but now today uh, it's been proven in, in in law and in court that that was illegal what they did back then, and. So here is a, a copy of, I um, can't remember her uh, name, but she was actually a member, and it says that basically that, uh, there's, that it's to certify that they are, you know, back then the term is half-breed, right? And um, so that they're basically discharging themselves from Papasteo's, that, that was his other name as well too, Papasteo or Papas Chase, and that they cease to be a treaty Indian as uh, defined in the, the said treaty. So they're basically, you know, now they're becoming Métis, you know, just by this document. And so the, there was a future development that um, the early settlers that they envisioned, like Frank Oliver and, and uh, others, that uh, they wanted to uh, develop this land. And... So I just want to read from this article here about uh, Frank Oliver and, and basically what he was uh, writing uh, writing about the band and uh, uh, you know and what he thought of them and, and their claim and also the Métis um, issue. So um, so Frank Oliver argued for the removal of the Cree from the Papa Chase Reserve, 115 square miles uh, between today's 51st Avenue and Ellerslie, because the land was needed for better men. Now is the time for the government to declare the reserve open and show whether uh, this country is to be run in the interest of the settler or Indian, he thundered. The block of land claimed by Papasteo's band consists of the choicest portion of this district. It has the best timber uh, hereabouts on it, uh, as well as water by lakes and creeks within three miles of the town. The government, government he said, should uh, take a common sense of, uh, view of this case and abandon the legal obligations under Treaty 6. Under extreme pressure, uh, three of the 40 families of the Papa Chase Band eventually assented to the first surrender of Indian land in Western Canada. Uh, so basically after that, uh, the majority of the band were, were uh, um, kicked off the band and they were looking at future development. So they had plans, they wanted to develop uh, throw it open for uh, settlement, bring in settlers, and, uh, and create the town and everything. And also the, the railroad, remember I mentioned the Palliser expedition? Anyway, they wanted to build a railroad out west, and the, they, they brought in BC into Confederation in 1871, but under the promise that they would, the railroad would come through. So Edmonton thought, they really pressured the uh, government back then for the railroad to come to Edmonton. 
what they, they do. Instead, they went to Calgary, and that really infuriated the settlers uh, here in Edmonton. They thought that, uh, that they were going to get a railroad. Now it had to come from Calgary uh, to um, Edmonton from the south. And when they come from that direction, who was in the way? It was the Poplar Chase Band. So, they, um, so that's one of the reasons why they petitioned for their removal as well. Because they were in the way, they wanted the land and throw it open for settlement. And so what they did was they uh, um, kicked the majority of them off the reserve, considered them Métis, and there was only 82 members left. Now what happened was uh, they told them in 1886 that they can stay and harvest their crops because they were farming by then. And um, 1887, they removed them totally. Now, over the years, you know, we've had meetings and, and things like that, and elders have come forward with stories. And there's a few, uh, few elders that have come forward, didn't know each other, you know, they were, you know, because a lot of people were scattered from, from this band, and we'll explain that in a bit here. Um, and they would explain that, that uh, back then, these people, some of these people didn't want to leave. And they were forced to leave. Some were killed, and some of the women were raped and things like that. And that's what these elders have said. And, and so a lot of things were disputing of, of, of the actual official record. The government considers this a uh, legal, legitimate uh, surrender. And we'll get into that next. So they removed these people from them and moved them over to Enoch. And some went to Alexander and also to uh, Musquachis. Uh, but today they're all scattered onto a lot of First Nations and Métis settlements. Uh, we'll get into that later. But what happened was, um, you know, they, they, they removed everybody by 1887. And, you know, they were doing everything backwards. Then they realized 1888, whoa, we need to take a surrender if we want to throw open this land and sell it. They couldn't sell it until they had a surrender. So they go to Enoch on four days' notice and said that uh, we need to have a meeting to consult with you, talk to you, uh, for the purpose of, you know, obtaining a surrender. And from the records that we, we found, uh, that there was eight men, and that was males over the age of 21 who can vote at the time. So out of eight, only three show up. Those three agreed to the surrender. And they sent it off to Ottawa, 1889. It was stamped, you know, done deal, right? But if you look in the Indian Act, Section 39, where that deals with surrenders, under the Indian Act, it says that a, a surrender is legal or, or, or legitimate if, if it's surrendered to the crown or the queen and if there's a majority of uh, members who consent to it. So you look at that, the th there was three that showed up and they, they all agreed. So to the government, that was, that was uh, 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 consent. But if you read further in the Indian Act, it says there that um, if there was uh, other voters remaining, then they were supposed to call a meeting within 30 days and get them to come and vote. They never did that. Plus two, we, we have a letter uh, saying uh, uh, where a superior was telling uh, uh, one of the Indian agents or people around here at the time that, okay, don't not only go to Enoch, but go to Alexander, go to Musquachis. They never did that either. So they didn't follow their own laws, their own rules. And so they didn't call, they didn't call the second meeting to get these other uh, men to vote. And so if you go with just Enoch, and you look at eight voting members, you need five. Five people, right? Five men. You only, they only had three. So that's why this is, this is an unlawful, illegal surrender. And so they removed the people, then they were doing everything backwards, they wanted to throw it open for a settlement. And they tried at a couple auctions, it didn't work in the early 1890s. And, um, and then, like I said, they were doing everything backwards. So there's these, these members at Enoch. So they go to Enoch, and they, and they approach them, and say, well, we need to amalgamate you. We're going to sell this land, and it needs to go to the benefit of the Papa Chase uh, members. And so well, we need to amalgamate Enoch and Papa Chase. That's what they did. So there's this amalgamation agreement out there in, uh, that was signed in 1894 by two, um, uh, they call them principal men, from both bands. And uh, so that's what we're contending. That was illegal as well. That they shouldn't have, you know, did what they did back then. They shouldn't have offered script to the people, you know, turn them into Métis by the stroke of a pen. 
they shouldn't have removed those those 82 members over to Enoch. That sh there there should still be, be a reserve today on the south side, and um, you know a, a band and uh, uh, you know in that community. So they removed these people to Enoch, Alexander, Musquachis, and then eventually they they scattered, intermarried onto other bands, and um, so. We'll get into, uh, okay, so here's Big Bear. Kind of got it into a, a backwards a bit. So this is a picture of Big Bear, and he's one of the leaders that uh, you know, joined the Real Rebellion. Um, so here's another view painting of uh, Fort Edmonton. I don't know if you can see down here. Uh, down here is there's uh, um, the fort here, and there's teepees. Would this be Rossdale today? Okay, so we dealt with the surrender and members. Uh, so here's a copy of the map. And so these squares here, these uh, black squares, these were, this is a map about 18, 1890s. And these were uh, actual lots that were sold. And the lots that were sold were to uh, German uh, uh, and settlers, um, majority of them. And they held, held these lands until about 1960. And that, that's when the city was starting to expand southward. So this area down here, Mill Woods and all that, that wasn't being, start, uh, being built until 19, late 60s, early 70s. So, the, uh, you know, so Edmonton was only up until about here, until about 1960. So all this was farmland for, for, for years, decades. Okay, so they had auctioned off. So the Papagee's banned today. Now, just want to get a bit into the history. So growing up, I didn't know about this history, and it was actually kept from my, my family and that. And and uh, Ed mentioned about uh, not living on a reserve, and, and that's true. My uh, late uh, grandmother was from Kihuan, but because she married my grandfather, who was... Um, considered Métis, uh, it's ironic because he, he could have gotten his uh, treaty status through Frog Lake, and that would have made us, you know, full status. But because uh, uh, my grandmother married off the reserve, she was forced to leave. And and so that's why we would go and, and go back to Kihiwan, which is uh, uh, f 15 miles south of Bonneville. And uh, so as a kid, you know, we, we, we uh, would go there quite a bit and visit our relatives. But we didn't know this history until 1995 when one of our relatives in Kihuan told one of my aunts, said, you know, you guys are descendants of this, this uh, Papa Chase Reserve. And we're, what? You know, it was a, we're, we're surprised by that. We didn't know. We had no clue. They didn't tell us all those years. And um, so we started looking into it. And there was uh, groups back then that were having meetings. And, you know, we were excited and all that. And we didn't know anything. Like I said, I didn't have a clue about any of this history growing up. And so this has been you know, quite, uh, quite a while since then, so I've, I've learned. There's actually more, and you know, I, I'd have to get into reading and stuff like that, but I just want to talk and, and just share from what I know. And uh, just kind of give you this basic uh, gist of it. And so what happened was th th this land was surrendered, illegally taken away, and eventually Edmonton was built on it. And so over the years, there was a lot of people that knew this history. But it wasn't until the 1970s, and those members from Enoch actually filed a claim in 1973, but it was rejected in 1975, and then it was laid dormant until late 80s or into the 90s when different groups started coming around again and wanted to uh, do something about it because there was a lot of uh, a sense of loss about this, uh, about, about this, uh, um, about this land. And so, um, so we had... Uh, subsequent meetings, and uh, back then those groups were petitioning the Treaty 6 chiefs, and he said, well, go back and settle your leadership issues. Have an election. And there were elders who, from different First Nations who sanctioned that and said, yeah, if you want to have a, recreate a band, resurrect this band, you need to have a chief and council. And I was just a young guy, and I ran, I got in, you know, I was excited, and, uh, but we had a chief named Rose Lehman, and so she was our chief until 2011. And under a custom council code, and, that, and we, we helped to draft that up. 
uh, we have a four-year term as opposed to two years. Because we thought, you know, two years you can't do anything. You can't do much. You know, four years, that gives you a lot of time to do a lot of work. And that's what last four years I've been doing. So I'll get into a bit about that. So here's Rossdale. And here's the, uh, uh, no, uh, which bridge is this? Anyway, let's, let's keep going. So we organized re-election. Here's my family tree, just quickly. And um, so there's me. That's not, I'm not the bear. <laughs> but anyway, here's Papa Chase down here. So we're going back a few generations. My late grandmother, my mother, and uh, uh, great great grandmother, and eventually Papa Chase. So that's what we require people to do: is do their genealogy, their family history, and sign uh, affidavits and that, uh, self-identifying as a descendant, proving your descendancy. So that, that way you can run in elections, you can vote, all that kind of stuff, and eventually. Be, and so we're taking in probationary uh, members. And we have about a thousand people who have signed up over the years, and um, so that's our, our where we're at right now. So we filed a claim in 2001. It was rejected in 2008 because a couple technicalities. One, they said we ran out of time, and, and it's uh, I don't buy that because they settled the the Métis claim that date goes back to 1870. They settled that recently a few years ago. That's even older than ours. And uh, also they said we weren't a recognized band. We tried to go to the Treaty 6 bands back in the early 2000s to help support us in this claim, and they didn't. If they would have joined our claim, we would be successful today. Things would, be, would turn out differently. And um, so here's uh, uh, Rossdale, and I'm going to point uh, this out here, this section. So here's the bridge today where it's, where it's getting uh, built, a new one right here. And uh, there'll be a picture about that. Here's Rossdale here. Here's the, where the, the old fort used to be up here. So here's this section here. This is actually the, the cemetery, legal cemetery today. And this section here, it was actually added in, but it's been excavated and all that to make way for the bridge. There was nothing there. It was just as a, a, an addition to that. And there's actually human remains here. This is what's left of the burial ground. It used to be a lot bigger. And uh, so this is Epcor's power plant, just Telus Field, and uh, other, uh, and this is Ross, the Rossdale community down there. So we protected this burial site. And, and so here's uh, some excavation work, um, early 2000s. And this is where they found the old forts that uh, I mentioned earlier, 1870, uh, uh, 1795 and early 1800s. So there was some forts down there actually. And, uh, uh, so this is, these are the remnants and they're finding that. And so this is the archeological work. So today, now, what we're, now what's uh, happening is we actually protested in, in, in uh, January 2012 because there was lack of consultation because they were of this new bridge you're building. And uh, that set off a, a series of events where the province stepped in and said, you must uh, 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 consult with uh, uh, Treaty 6, 7, and 8 for, uh, bands that have people that are buried in there, plus Papa Chase, plus Michelle Band, and, and the Métis Nation. So uh, we helped to kick that, that off, and so now they must, every time they put a shovel to ground, they have to consult with us, and they have to, um, and so it's a way of protecting, because I've been pushing for this type of thing, that any time they do any work down there, they must have archaeologi ar archaeologists on site, and site monitors from the different bands and nations. And um, so that's the, that's, that's, uh, the work that's been taking place. So this Belvedere here, or these, I mean these uh, panels, uh, that's down there by, by this is on uh, River Valley Road and by 105th Street, just coming off the bridge. This tells the history. We were involved in this, um, where they were, uh, it, uh, it talks about the history of, of, of the area. So when we had repatriation in 2006, there were human remains taken out of there in the 60s and 70s that were being kept at the University of Alberta's anthropology department. We told the city and the U of A, we want them reburied. So th this is the area where they're reburied. They were buried in pine co coffins, and we had a big ceremony, and the road was closed and everything. And this is the monument here. These are actually plaques where these are, there's actual names here. But there's also, and that's a frustrating part too, is sometimes it'll just say Cree hunter, 
uh, Cree woman, Cree man, and so sometimes there wasn't complete records. And but I'm um, I'm proud to say that there's uh, Papa Chase. There's a plaque here that has Papa Chase ancestors on there. Plus on the Bruno side, I have a couple ancestors that are buried in there as well. So th th it's personal to me. And so we had uh, uh, we're involved in the city in creating this this monument. So the elders said they wanted um, you know uh, earth um, elements. You know the the stone grass. Iron ore, and these are teepees representing the, 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 the teepee teachings. And so you can see Walterdale Bridge in the background here. Here's the south side, and um, the river is just right there. And uh, so this is, this is uh, that area there. Now, uh, and also there, uh, where Papa Chase is buried, he, he passed away in 1918 and was buried uh, by Eleanor Lake. And there's a burial site there where there's other ancestors as well, Quinns and others, uh, glad Jews and cardinals that are buried in there. So there's a map, and I posted this on my Facebook page because uh, we've gone up there ever since 2001, and we've gone up there to, to, to clear the area and to pay our respects and that, and it's three miles into the bush from the hamlet, so it's an old wagon trail. So you literally have to either walk in, go in by quad, horse, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's an old uh, uh, you know, trail that's been used for a long time. So here's a, a picture of the, uh, and you can see the crosses there. And um, we didn't get the chance to clear it last time. We took uh, some ladies, uh, this is in 2007. We took some members from Ochis, some descendants that wanted to go. This is October. And uh, that's uh, Councillor Joyce Bruno on the far right. And um, so here is in 2012. And uh, these two ladies here, they're from the province. Uh, this is a gentleman that's, uh, they, they helped film our journey into there. It's on our website, actually, uh, publishes.ca, uh, Councillor Joyce Bruno. And these members here, they're, they're actually descendants from Enoch. So it was very important that, uh, you know, we went in there with uh, Enoch members as well. And these, uh, this gentleman here, Raymond and his son, they're from the Ellen, Eleanor Lake area. They actually live up there, so they help us to uh, organize these events, and of course, that's uh, me. And this cross here um, was made by Elder Ernie Desjolay, and uh, he, put, he got that uh, installed in there. So uh, today, we're, we're, there's consultation happening with uh, the City of Edmonton, ATCO, EPCOR, uh, and you know, that's, to me, that's huge, being an unrecognized band, that they actually recognize this in, the, in this process. And, uh, you know, they're actually recognized the First Nation. And so this was last year at, down at uh, uh, Epcor's property there on the, on the site. They were digging out these old pipelines. They were uh, removing them. So we're watching. And this is, um, they're, they're putting in a, 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 a by Terwilliger, a footbridge, crossing the river from South Edmonton to Terwilliger. That's another archeo archaeological site where we were consulted and we did site monitoring there as well. So there's... Uh, our actual archaeological work here. And here, I was on, on that big building, you know, a big uh, power generation building. I was up there recently, actually working on top. So here's the, the cemetery I'm talking about. But you can see all this development. So because of all this development, and there used to be a, a, a traffic circle here, and when they were taking the traffic circle out and building this, there was a lot of human remains in the 60s that were taken out of there. So that's the scope of work that we've been doing is, 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 is engaging the city and, and with companies and basically, and that's why there, this EPCOR want to expand this plant. And so this building I'm standing on, it's like a victory because we, we shut down that expansion and help to protect what's left. There's actually human remains in here. You can't see it, but there's actually a rock here. Uh, we told EPCOR we wanted this fence moved back and uh, first place they dug, they, they hit a grave. 2003, right? So there's, there's act, this is an actual burial site right here. And so here's the bridge construction uh, that's going on today. So all this area that they've excavated and dug around here, that was all, all gone through and sifted by archaeologists. They did find bones, but it was animal bones. They found a jaw bone, they found a bison skull, all things like that, chicken bones. Um, so this is the bridge uh, work that's being done here. And so they're going to put that new bridge here. So th that's the work today that we're doing. 
And um, yeah, and that, that's pretty much it. And I just want to just uh, thank everyone for taking time to listen to me. Um, you know, I hope you gained a little better understanding of, of our band and our history. There's a lot more to it than that, but it's just that it, it, would, it would take a lot more time. But I hope you get a good understanding of, you know, what took place back then. Our band was, um, it was a legal surrender. And, you know, there was a dispute with the, 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 the settlers and uh, they didn't want our people around this area. And so they removed us. So they, they scattered across to a lot of different First Nations. So that's the work today that what we're doing is re reclaiming those people. And there's people that want to come back and are, and are joining, uh, want to join us. You know, I, I get calls, even today, I got, I got more calls of people wanting to come back and join us. But that's what we're doing is I'm working with the city, and I'm, I'm meeting with the province, and uh, plus these, there's companies that are recognizing us, so it's coming. But it, you know, it, it's, it's a matter of taking time and we're trying to get set up and 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 uh, recognize so that way our people can come back. Hi, hi. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chief. It's not a wonderful uh, presentation of the history of Edmonton, uh, South uh, South Edmonton, and you know. Uh, this kind of history is not being told to ordinary Edmontonians, Albertans, Canadians. This story has to be told because uh, if we want a justice for uh, the Papashis people uh, so they can get uh, their land back, a portion of their land back, Hey, this story has to be told, retold to every uh, Edmontonian because uh, I'm sure that uh, after they hear this story, the, the Papasis people are going to get a lot of support. They have a lot of uh, support from their average of brothers and sisters here in this province. I want to thank uh, Chief Gavin Bruno. But uh, listen, uh, we're going to open up uh, uh, for the next uh, half hour. If you have any questions, hey, please uh, get up and uh, ask uh, some questions. Uh, you know, uh, after all, this is also a National Aboriginal Day week, and this is a, a very good thing that uh, we're, we're able to bring to you uh, from the uh, Amiskuchi History Project.